This is Engine Performance 1 Test 14, Electronic Throttle Control System, Fuel Injection Diagnosis, Emission Controls, and Scan Tool. That's quite a bit there. I'll say, what'd you guys get for uh, number one? Technician A says electronic throttle control uses a stepper motor. Uh, B says electronic throttle control is spring loaded to about 16 to 20 percent of throttle opening. Uh, technician B. Uh, that was B. And then on the second one, you got after servicing the air filter on electronic throttle control vehicle, a technician has forgotten to connect the throttle motor wiring. What will happen when the vehicle is started? See, the engine will start. It starts, won't accelerate. Here's something else. If you're ever looking in there at that throttle plate, don't move it with your hand because on some vehicles you'll mess that little ETC motor up. Some you will, some you won't. You don't want to know which ones until you've done it and it's $400. When the ignition is first turned on, a click noise is heard from under the hood of a vehicle equipped with electronic throttle control. Technician A says this is the normal operation of the ETC self test. Technician B says the uh, throttle actuator motor should not move unless the engine is running. Who's right about that? That's technician A only because when you've got that breather off, if somebody mashes the throttle, you're going to see the throttle open. If somebody mashes the gas, even if the engine's not running, you'll see the throttle open in that. Uh, electronic throttle control doesn't need idle speed control. It doesn't need a cruise control actuator because it does everything with the throttle plate, right? Number, all throttle, electronic throttle control systems uh, include the following components except A, idle control switch, B, throttle position sensor, C, accelerator pedal position sensor, or D, throttle valve actuator. They don't have an idle control switch. No reason to have an idle control switch on there. Technician A says an electronic throttle control uses a stepper motor. Technician B says electronic throttle control uses a vacuum control stepper motor to keep the throttle at 16 to 20% throttle opening. Who's right about it? Both of those guys are a couple of yo-yos. Neither one of them know what they're talking about. Um, let's see. With the ignit let's see. Uh, little, 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 uh, with ignition off and the key on, what should happen if the technician uses a screwdriver to push on the throttle plate in an attempt to open the valve? The throttle should move, then spring back home to the home position when released. Like I say, don't do that. Words to the wise. Buddy of mine's got his own shop. He told me that he was used to doing that without a problem, and he did it on one particular car, and after and it destroyed the electronic throttle control. I mean, what's the point? If you can get, you know, if you could push the gas pedal to the floor and it'll open it for you, why? Why do you push it? You know, I'm like, you know, he's want, they want you to check and see if it's binding or something, I guess. But I'm just spooked about that because there's a lot of there's a lot at stake. The throttle body may be cleaned if recommended by the vehicle manufacturer. If what conditions are occurring? Coast down stall. Lower than normal idle speed or rough idle, any of the above. Yep. All right. What test is being performed here? Question number eight. What are you, what test is being performed here? Uh, hey, very good. You guys are just you guys knew your stuff. What do you usually get on an injector when you measure the resistance of it? You know. It depends on whether it's a high performance car or not. It's been my experience. If you're working on some super duper high performance car. The injector resistance is going to be a lot lower than it is on a regular car. Usually about 14 to 16 ohms. That's a that's a sort of a you know wide. I mean that's, a, that's pretty subjective. Uh, what test is being performed in this picture here? Inject your voltage drop. Do you, do you agree with that? Everybody agree with that? Supply voltage drop. Supply. Well, look at where you're hooking from battery positive to the hot side of the injector. Supply side voltage drop. How much voltage is being lost on the way? Um, number 10, how much voltage is generally available to the fuel injectors? Will the battery, battery, battery voltage, that's absolutely correct. Uh, I went to look at a truck that wouldn't start on Friday over there, and whenever I, I turned it on, the theft light was flashing, the, the scan tool wouldn't communicate with the PCM, and I went out there and I got one of the fuel injectors. I got my test light, I, you know, nice low impedance test light. And I hooked it up to the uh, ground, and when I touched the wire going to the injector, it came on very, very dim. And whenever it came on very dim, I knew there was an issue, and I went over and tapped on the uh, power relay, and it lit up, and then everything started talking, it fired up. So I needed a relay on that one. Uh, which term describes the electrical current flow in the opposite direction when the injector coil is energized? That's number 11. That's inductive reactance, by the way. Um, basically, whenever you... Uh, energize a coil whenever magnetism starts flowing through it. Uh, I kind of like call it injective reluctance or whatever, but what happens is as it gets more magnetism, it resists current flow. That's basically what you're talking about there. Technician A says if fuel pump pressure is correct, fuel pump volume will be correct as well. Technician B says if, that a fuel pump may produce specified pressure, but below specified volume. 
Who's right about that? Um, Pressure can be right, but volume can be low. Why? Think about it. Fuel filter, right? You can have good pressure, but lousy volume. How do you know that? If you have fuel pressure, pressure, fuel pressure gauge taped to the windshield and you get on it and it starts out, it feels pretty good and it starts losing power and your fuel pressure is going down. See what I'm saying? When the motor homes used to come in, they say, this thing's you know, quitting on us and losing power whenever it's hot and all this. First thing I'd do is unplug, unplug the vacuum line from the fuel pressure regulator so it would bounce up to about 40 pounds, have my fuel pressure gauge on it, and just stomp the throttle. Boom! Just real quick. Just real quick clap. And if I see the, get, the pressure drop and come back up, I know they need a fuel pump. My diagnosis is done. You can do that on just about any vehicle. If you, you know. Now, that particular one, after you change a fuel filter, you go for the fuel pump because the fuel filter could be clogged. But they'll say, well, we've already put a fuel filter on it, most of them, you know. And the stupid thing about the motorhomes, they had 80 gallons of gasoline in them. And we didn't have anywhere to store all that crap. So I had to figure out a way to get that 80-gallon gas tank over there. How much does a gallon of gas weigh? Pounds. Huh? A gallon? Six pounds, about. What's six times 80? 480 pounds. It's nearly 500 pounds that gas tank weighed. That smash you flat, wouldn't it? All right, which one are we on? Uh, Technician A says to pressure clean the fuel system at between 75 and 90 psi before starting the engine. Uh, Technician B says to pressure clean the fuel system by using a 2.1 2 to 1 mixture of solvent to gasoline. Who's correct about that? That's A. Uh, the following statements are all correct except A, the fuel rail and pressure regulator should be cleaned as well as fuel injectors. Relearning the PCM should never be attempted. Let me see what Sonia wants. Hang on. Hey, Sonia. Hey. Yeah, which one? Okay, get it over here. Send it the better. Um, let me see. Hang on, make me able to make that happen. Here you go, little bit right here. You know how to make that happen? Okay. All right. Put it in the stutter. Put it right there. Yeah, I was talking about that. Let me take that new one over here. All right. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, la, 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 la. What was it going to say? Number 14, suffice to say, is B, relearning the PCM should never be attempted. That's kind of stupid because you know you should. Which of the following described reasons for poor engine performance in cold weather? Contaminated fuel, low fuel pressure, insufficient fuel volume? All, All of the above. You guys know enough now. Technician A says the fuel system should be diagnosed first in a no start condition. Condition Technician B says the ignition system trigger device is used to synchronize fuel injection. Who's right about that? Now they say both technicians are right, but what I'm always telling people is don't check the fuel pressure until you've checked the spark. Why? You're usually gonna squirt a little fuel out there or leak some out. Mm -hmm. You check the fuel, if there's fuel goes out here, then you check the spark, you set the motor on fire. What's wrong with that deal? Check the spark first, okay? Always check the spark first. Easiest thing to check usually anyway, but uh, don't check spark after you've checked for fuel. All right, I actually had them catch fire on me out there. There's one, uh, you know, I'd already checked the spark, and then I went to check the fuel, and for some reason the distributor was leaking a spark, and it caught poof, caught fire, and I blew it out, and it came back, and I blew it out, and it came back, and I blew it out, and it came back. I thought it blew myself out of wind. Where do you go? If you go to get a fuel fire extinguisher, you're going to burn the car down to the rims in the parking lot. That's how fast it. I can blow it out, and come back, blow it, blow it out. <laughs> That's pretty scary. Help! Help! <laughs> Somebody come give me a hand. Well, what do you do? You know, you got a screwdriver and a pair of pliers in your hand. You can't put out a fire with that. It's terrible. No water around anywhere. All right, so um, let's see. Uh, during the fuel injector pressure drop test, uh, let me see. The difference between any fuel and two fuel injectors should not exceed what? Now, you guys did a pressure drop test. Mm -hmm. They shouldn't uh, exceed one and a half PSI. An injector pressure drop test is being discussed. Technician A says, uses a special service tool to pulse fuel injectors. You guys have used that, right? Mm -hmm. Technician B says, the injector for each cylinder should only be flow tested four times without starting the engine, which technician is correct. That, uh, the first guy uh, is, they say is correct. I don't like putting a whole lot of fuel in there, you know, because that injector's gonna go, it's gonna spray fuel in there with that 500 millisecond pulse you got there. All of these types of, they, they say, just if you wanna get that one right, just put A down there, but I don't like that. All of these are types of fuel injectors except peak and hole, saturated switch, pulse width modulated, 
all of them, you know, all of them good. That's D, all of these are, you got saturated, which peak and hole, pulse modulated. When looking at a solenoid with an oscilloscope, what event often follows replying or removing power from the coil windings? And this is basically talking about uh, uh, the end on an injector. What you see is, you know, you're reading the side that triggers the injector. When it's pulled to ground, this is how long it stays to ground. When you release it, you get this. That's a spike. That's a voltage spike. Five, about, 50, about 50 volts is what it is. Okay, uh, explain the natural... Uh, the engine off natural vacuum evaporative <laughs> checking system. That's a fun one, isn't it? Well, the premise is that a warm evaporative system will cool down after the engine is shut off and the vehicle is stable. So a slight vacuum will be created in the gas tank during the cool down period. And if a specific level of vacuum is reached and maintained, the, the system said to have integrity. It's got a little switch in there, you see. It's supposed to close and stay closed. If this little switch, the, the, the switch is, is, the vacuum closes the switch as the vacuum in the, as the tank uh, cools down, you know, that's natural vacuum leak detection. And they don't even, it's pretty cool the way they did that. You know, Chrysler came out with that first, to my knowledge. Uh, true or false, the catalytic converter stores then burns oxygen. Had is false. It stores oxygen, but it doesn't burn it. This drawing shows a catalytic converter with exhaust gas entering the cap. What are the gases changed to at the cap outlet? Hey. What do you think, guys? Hey. Hey. You've already been there, haven't you? Yes, did you did you go that far and get that one right? Yes, H2O and CO2. Have you guys ever uh, drank any dihydrogen monoxide? Yeah, you have. That's water. Okay, that sounds that sounds nasty, doesn't it? Okay, okay. The O2 sensors in this OBD2 system are sending voltage as shown. What conclusion can be reached as a result of the two O2 sensors in that? That's right. It's not storing oxygen. If you got both of them switching together, you're gonna get a PO420. Which Pins of the DLC should be connected in order to receive the flash codes on GM, GM OBD1 PCM. How about A and B? Can you get that? A and B? Question number 26. Uh, not that you're ever going to need to know that probably, but which tool could be used on Ford OBD1 system to retrieve the, retrieve the, retrieve the diagnostic trouble codes if the star tester is not available? Basically, believe it or not, you can use an analog voltmeter because it just sweeps and you just count the sweeps. Now, what I did was I built me a little box with a, with a light in it. I had a button, a box, and I built that thing and I'd plug it in and I'd mash that button. I'd put it in the self-test and I'd watch that light flash and I'd just read them codes of the storm. Well, I kind of like the, the fast codes. The old Ford OBD1 system puts out slow codes and fast codes. The slow codes come out slow enough to where you can count them. The fast codes come out like in a burst. And if the tool is a good one, it'll read those fast codes. And, uh, and that's pretty cool. Uh, that was what I did. Did I get the right one? The black one? You gave me the keys. Oh, the I mean, did you go to the bookstore? Yes. And you went to the business office, right? Which one's the business? The bookstore is where the books are. The lady in the there is right on the black one. Leave that one there. I still need it. Go get the black one and bring it to me. He brought back the wrong Brown Victoria. Good grief. All right. All right then. Well, both of them are close to the same color, but he brought back the wrong one. What am I going to do with that boy? All right. Uh, let me see. Um, how many times must the ignition switch be cycled on to put a Chrysler into self test mode? Actually, three. They don't even have the right answer on here. If you put the Chrysler, like if you want to put the Chrysler, uh, an older OBD1 Chrysler in there, bam, bam, bam. Here's an example. My dad had, my mom had this 91 Chrysler, and he says, this light come on that says power loss. And I says, well, turn on the key three times to see how many times it blinks. He goes, I'm not fooling with that. You know, well, he was a mechanic for years, but he's he don't fool with that. So I'm going to flash codes or nothing. I says, all right, well, I'll come look at it. So I turned it on, got a code 17. That means the engine's running too cold. I said, needs a thermostat put in it. So he puts the thermostat in it. He's I can put a thermostat in. So he puts the thermostat in it. Then he drove it for a little bit and everything's fine. And then he said, well, I think I'm going to change the oil in it. So he goes to change the oil in it. And he says, I changed the oil in it. All I did is pull into the car, change the oil. And whenever I uh, got through changing the oil, the darn thing wasn't idle. Switch it up, crank it up, goes dead. Crank it up, goes dead. Crank it up. You can keep it alive with your foot. What is it? And I thought about it for about 10 seconds. I said, take battery cables off. Just take battery cables off and leave them off for a little bit and put them back on. So he does that, puts them back on, cranks it up and runs just fine. He goes, what the heck was that? I said, well... It was running too cold for a long time. Cold is rich. Going past the rings, you get gas in the oil. The oil starts to get slightly contaminated with gasoline. It's pulling that through the, 
the uh, PCV system, the adaptive learning has actually factored all of that in. Now the gas isn't there because you've changed it all, and it's like having a carburetor out of adjustment. You know? Hello? Yeah. Well, the navy blue one is one that I need to inspect, and that's good, but uh, Sonia called me and told me that the black one's giving trouble, and so he went to, she says the bookstore uh, is, lady is whoever is in there, Kathy, has got the black ground Victoria, and she said that it's not, the window's not working and the wipers run all the time. And so we gotta put a wiper on. That's okay, I need that one. I'm, it's good, well, we're gonna inspect it too. Okay, um, let me see. Uh, which one? What was that one? Which one? It didn't have the right answer on it. Oh, it's, uh, just put B because that's the answer they want, but that ain't right. You're supposed to switch it on three times. Technician A says generic scan tools must be able to read all generic OBD2 modes, codes. Excuse me. Technician B says the all generic scan tools must be able to read the manufacturer OBD2 codes. And you know, they, they can actually see the code, but they're not going to tell you what it means. Usually you'll get it, but it'll just say manufacturer specific code and won't define it for you. Uh, if you get the code, though, you're halfway there. Because you can Google it, huh? Uh, that, that particular one is 28. It's basically saying A. That's going to be A because, it, you know, they're saying it won't. But, I mean, I've never seen a generic tool that wouldn't pull, pull all the codes. I may be off in left field, but, you know, maybe some of them won't. Technician A says non-emission-related codes that make the mill illuminator call type A codes. Technician B says not that emission-related codes that illuminate the mill after the first falls are called type A codes. Yeah, that's sort of, you know, protection can be only. The type A codes are the real serious ones. Uh, vehicles being checked with a scan tool after sitting in a shop overnight, key on engine off. Technician A says the IAT sensor and the ECC sensor will read about the same temperature. And I say about the same temperature because that's what they'll read. Technician B says these two sensors will read differently depending on barometric pressure. Eh, that's wrong. So that's uh, number 30 is A and 31. Type blank DTC will set if an emission problem may cause damage to the catalytic converter. Uh, that's 31. That is C, a type A code. Uh, it's like if it damages the catalytic converter, it means it's misfiring and it's pumping gas in there. But most of the ones that after about 1995, most of the systems I'm familiar with, if they know it's misfiring on a particular cylinder, the PCM will shut the injector off to that cylinder, which can trick you if you're not careful. Because you'll say it's skipping on that cylinder. I'm not hearing the injector. There must be a problem with that. Switch it off, restart it, and see if it starts firing and then quits, you know. If it's misfiring on that cylinder because of a spark plug or some other, re some other reason, it'll turn that injector off. Uh, type blank DTCs are set by non-emission related diagnostic tests. That's number 32, uh, and that is uh, C and D. Um, in other words, non-emission emission related uh, diagnostic tests won't even usually turn on the check engine light. Sometimes they will, but usually won't. A freeze frame is stored when, a, when what type uh, DTC is set? That would be D. An A or B. Freeze frame is a snapshot. It's got about a dozen different parameters, sometimes more, sometimes less, of where what was going. You've seen those, haven't you? You've seen freeze frame, yeah. Uh, technician A says, excuse me, a PCM reprogrammer requires the use of a special battery charger. That's true. You need one that won't ripple. I've got a $550 Medtronic's battery charger that I use when I'm reflashing a PCM, and it's a little small thing. But really important. If the operating software of PCM needs updating, uh, it's easily done through a PCM exchange program. <laughs> That's funny. You're basically going to reflash them now. In the olden days, we put another PCM on them when you couldn't reflash them. Technician A says a vehicle, well, some of the earlier GMs had a little cal pack they could put on there, you know, pull a little uh, centipede chip out of the thing and pop it in there. Technician A says a vehicle may have stored DTCs even if the mill is not illuminated. Technician B says all DTCs will eliminate the mill. Remember what I told you about the, the PCM having two different rooms in it? It's got an enhanced room and a, you know, sometimes you may have a, you may clear a code and it, the, the thing may stay on, then you go in the other room. <laughs> you know, uh, but you, I mean, you'd be surprised how many mechanics, if you start talking to mechanics that work with diagnostic trouble codes on cars every day, and uh, they may use a different term for it, but if you ask them if they've looked in both rooms or both part, both sides, if you looked in the enhanced and the OBD2 side, uh, a lot of them are going to argue with you and say, well, it doesn't matter, but it does. I mean, now, the one, the, the, when you think it doesn't matter is when you'll get you get burned. You know, I mean, we, I've had that happen. I was at the Ford place for years, and I got a new generation star tester just like we used it at Ford place. We had an Escort out here, skipping on number four, and it had a misfire code in it. And whenever we went out here and, you know, I pounded out of the injector, what seated good, plugged it in, cleared the code out of the enhanced room, and the darn light stayed on. I had to go into the OBD2 room to clear the light, clear the code to get rid of the light. It was still stored in that one room and it wasn't in the other one, you know. That's not, 
perfectly always going to be that way, but be prepared for it because you may run into it. Um, let's see, the number 36 is basically going to be A. Uh, technician A says most TSBs involve a specific stored diagnostic trouble code. Technician B says ECT and IAT reading should be close to the same temp after it's set for several hours. It's a no-brainer. That's true. And we got four more questions left. Technician A says a power balance test is the best way to isolate the problem cylinder. Well, yeah, sort of. Technician B says a compression test and cylinder leakage test can help determine the cause of the problem. Who's done that recently? Compression test and cylinder leakage. Smith in the red shirt over there. He's done it. All right. Um, okay. Which Huh? Which Put it bay? in the middle, middle bay, that flat stall. So that'd be both? Um, yeah, that would be uh, on number 38. Uh, yeah, that's Charlie. When, sh when should a diagnostic trouble codes be cleared? That's after the repair has been verified, but I'm going to tell you what I do, and I don't know why they don't have it in here. If I get a laundry list of trouble codes, I'm going to wrap those suckers down, and I'm going to dump them. And then I'm going to drive the car again and see which ones come back. The one that comes back first is the one you need to worry about first. The rest of them may be trash codes. Sometimes trash codes will be there as a reason, you know, as a related to the first code. Um, let's see. Which of the following should be checked before returning the vehicle to the customer? Radio presets and clock have been restored. Vehicle's clean. Radio's turned off. All, All of these are correct. Don't play the radio. The customer's radio is not your virtual stereo. Leave the darn radio alone. I turn it off when I get in there. Uh, as a matter of fact, if I could safely drive the vehicle, I wouldn't move the seat, I wouldn't adjust the mirrors. I would just clean the steering wheel. You give it back, they don't have to do all of that crap. If they get it back and all of the mirrors got to be adjusted and all the seats got to be adjusted and they got to spend five minutes getting ready to go and the radio station's on some head banging crap they don't ever listen to, that's bad news, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. All right, so just try not to, and make sure that uh, the uh, sunroof is not open. Sometimes they'll bring it in there and forget to close the sunroof. Then you may put it out there, it may rain, and then the, sun, then the lady will get in there and she'll splash into that seat, you know, that's wet. We had that happen one time and it wasn't pretty. She was in, technician A said, use the scan tool to clear, to clear stored diagnostic trouble codes. Technician B says, clear and diagnostic trouble codes will also clear all of the non-continuous OBD2 monitors. Who's right about that? Both of them, actually. They'll clear all the non-continuous monitors. All right. You know what a continuous monitor is? A continuous monitor is something that's watching all the time. Never stops watching it. Always watching it. Like, for instance, is the throttle position sensor voltage within a certain range? That's what it's looking for. Yeah. Now, if it fails within the range, it may be not throw you a code. You know what I mean? Like if it, let's say that the throttle position sensor is supposed to go from half a volt to four and a half volts and it won't go above about three volts, it won't tell you about that. But if it wobbles out of that range between a half to one to four and a half, it's going to tell you. That's a continuous monitor. Now, there are other things that it cannot monitor continuously. One of them is catalytic converter operation. Another one is fuel. Another one's EGR. There's, a, there's a, some things that certain criteria have to be met before it can even look at it. You see what I mean? There's some, you just don't look at it until it's time to look at it on some of them things. We didn't uh, do 20 huh? What happened to him? Why was he not here? Were you gone whenever I did 20 and 21? Well, 20 is uh, B. Uh, 21 is, yeah. Well, 21 is that, is that essay question. Did you, did you uh, record my essay and write it down? Whenever you park it, the gas is going to contract. The pressure is going to go down. It looks for that to happen. If it doesn't happen, it knows there's a leak. Okay? Anybody got any questions?